Uh, I want to know, does anybody want a word tonight? That's my question. Does anybody want a word? So I want us to look at a few verses of scripture found in the book of Exodus chapter number 14. Exodus chapter number 14. And I'm going to read a few verses beginning at verse number 21. Exodus 14. And I'm, I'm going to read a few verses beginning with verse number 21. It says this, um, family. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen began to follow them into the sea. And during the last night of the watch, the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let us get away from the Israelites. Their Lord or the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. I want to tag a title to this text, and I want you, even through your mass, to say it as an affirmation and a declaration to yourself. You are not talking to your neighbor tonight. You are talking to yourself. Here's the title of the nice teaching. Somebody shout, look again. Okay, about 33 of y'all actually did it with a little enthusiasm. Let's try it one more time. Somebody shout, look again. again. Now give God praise if you're ready for the word tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the book of Exodus is probably one of the most profound books in the Old Testament. I say that not just because of the content contained in this book. I, I say that because of the context of this book. You see, the word exodus means exit. Because this book, Exodus, details how God orchestrated an exit for his people out of Egyptian bondage that they suffered in for 400 years. The name of the book itself should invoke and create some optimism and enthusiasm. Because if God is the God of exits, this means I'm never trapped. I want to say that again. If God is the God of exits, it means that I'm never trapped, that I, it may look trapped, I may feel trapped, people may call me trapped, but because he's the God that is the God of the exits, watch this, if there isn't one, he'll create one. Did you hear what I said? It, it, if, a, if a Jericho wall's in the way, he'll knock it down. If the Red Sea's in the way, he'll part it. There doesn't have to be an exit for there to be an exit. Somebody's going to catch that. There doesn't have to be an exit for there to be an exit. And I'm pausing for the cause to talk to somebody tonight who feels like you're without options. Just because you hadn't been exposed to your options doesn't mean you don't have any options. And the devil wants to blind you to the options that God's getting ready to expose you to because he knows a person who does not realize they have options is a person that ends up making desperate decisions. You way too blessed to be desperate. You way too anointed to be desperate. Your God is way too big to be desperate. If he don't get you in through the window, he'll get you through the door. And if he don't get you in through the door, he'll get you through the roof. And if somebody's in the way trying to block you from what God wants to do for you, he'll move them out the way. He's the God that raises up one and pulls down another. I'm getting ready to make an exit. I don't know who this is for tonight, but I want to tell you it does not matter how long you've been trapped. God is the God of the exit. 
Are you here? Am I making sense? For over 400 years, God's people were under Egyptian oppression and subjugation. 400 years. 400 years. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 that they cried out to God. Say, Lord, you got to get me out of this. 400 years. And God let them stay there until they decided they were ready to come out. Come on, no, 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 come on now. Creating exits was always in his ability. He could have created one on the first year. He could have created one on the second year. It was 400 years because God will let you live on whatever level you settle for. He says, now, if you are right with that, (laughs) did you hear what I just said? And see, this is why I want to tell you now, I I talked about disruption early and shifts and changes and radical pivots and things of that nature. You know, God, here's one of the signs that helps you know God's getting ready to shift and make a radical pivot in your life. He gives you what one writer calls a holy discontent. All of a sudden, you start being dissatisfied with something you never had any problem with. And you end up being confused. And you're like, I used to like this. I used to like them. Let me go on this side over here. (laughs) I used to like this. I used to like them. I used to be okay with this. But now, all of a sudden, there's a stirring on the inside of me that does not allow me to be satisfied with it with this with the same level because God uses agitation as an instrument to orchestrate elevation I want to know is there anybody agitated tonight because if you agitated get ready because elevation is on the way I want somebody that believes God's getting ready to elevate you out of your agitation to just pause for the cause give them a praise break right there I'm giving you holy permission tonight to rid yourself of guilt of being dissatisfied with something that God's trying to disrupt. Dissatisfied doesn't mean ungrateful. Some people assume dissatisfied means ungrateful. Therefore, they create an obligation to stay stuck in states and seasons God's trying to shift them out of. I'm grateful for what you did in the past, but I'm anticipating what you're getting ready to do in my future. 400 years. He let them stay there. Until they said, this not it. Now, I want you to see this now. I want you to see what had happened. When they enter into Egypt, they enter into Egypt. When Egypt was led, in some sense, managed, rather, by a gentleman named Joseph. Remember? Rest of the rest of the land was in famine. Egypt had plenty. So when Joseph got a position of prominence in Pharaoh's administration, he called for his family to come to Egypt and to be with him. Text says that Pharaoh died. And Exodus opens by saying there arose a Pharaoh in Egypt that did not know Joseph. See, come on now. This is why we need to expand our expectation of favor. You don't just want favor with man. Come here, Luke 2.52. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. I don't just need favor with man. I want favor with God because when that Pharaoh die, I might be in trouble. There arose a Pharaoh in Egypt. Look at me. That did not know Joseph. And he was fine with the Israelites until they kept growing. (laughs) one translation uses the word multiplied 
Okay, everybody that's 38 and older is about to catch this. 38 and under, you're about to miss it. I'll come back and get you next. They were like Bebe's kids. <laughs> come on, old folks. Don't come on. You, we, we out here now. Bebe's kids. We don't die. We. He was okay with them occupying their space, his space, until they kept multiplying. And it looked like the Hebrew population was trending toward exceeding the Egyptian population. So he expected them to procreate. He didn't just expect them to multiply. He expected them to grow. He didn't just expect them to grow like that. They expected you to be blessed. But they didn't expect you to be that blessed. Yeah, they expected a door to open for you, but they didn't expect that many doors to open for you. See, some people, watch this, some people, some people that love you, watch this, that love you well in the previous season are gonna have trouble with you in the future season because your success is about to be their trigger. See. Some, some of you are saying things like, they changed on me. They hadn't changed. You just hadn't got to a level of growth that triggered an insecurity that was present but dormant. Say, we expect you to grow like this. I wanted you to win, but you're winning too much. Are y'all ready for this? And if many of us are going to continue to, I'm telling you what I know, if you're going to continue to advance, if we're going to continue to grow, if we're going to continue to evolve, if we're going to continue to increase in defectiveness, we have to learn what Dr. Henry Cloud says, what we are not and are responsible for. Because some of us are holding up our growth, feeling responsible for somebody else's insecurity. Why is it that I got to play small for us to be friends? Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, why do I have to operate with a limited version of myself for you to be okay with me? If you really love me, you need to be able to handle all of the iterations of me because God's getting ready to do something in my life. And I'm getting ready to pray this over your life. I pray God send you some friends that can handle what's coming. You, gosh. Some of us are just holding on to people that can handle where you were. I pray that God send you some people that are healthy enough to handle what he's getting ready to do in your life. Don't miss this. Pharaoh mismanaged his exposure to their growth. What God was doing in the Hebrews should have inspired Pharaoh to transition from being a polytheistic worshiper, a person who worshiped a number of different gods, to actually becoming a monotheistic worshiper, worshiping the one and true and living God. But he got jealous of what he should have been inspired by. Did you hear what I just said? See, some people could really learn from you if they stop hating on you. This section with me tonight, so let me pause right here. I said some people could really learn from you if they stop being jealous of you. Some people could really learn from you if they stop competing with you because they competing and you ain't even playing the game. I'm not even on that. Right? 
and people with myopic mindsets and fundamentalist uh, and traditionalist viewpoints really do that in religious spaces, right? They get to arguing and competing over church spots and church titles and church responsibility. And you sitting there like, boo, you fighting over church. I'm trying to change the world. So he begins to deal harshly with them. He begins to persecute them. He engages in male genocide. God uses a a, a creative, this is a whole nother sermon. He uses a a creative and an innovative and a resourceful woman. Uh, Moses had a father. He was in his life, but the Bible just doesn't tell us about him, but it tells us about when that decree of genocide went out. Moses, his mama said, well, I don't know what's going to happen with everybody else, baby. You're not getting mine. So she gets resourceful and creative and, and, and you know the story and, he, and, and the, it, it's, it's really, really interesting because, you know, he grows up and he lives with, he lives with what some of us are struggling with. It, it's what W.E.B. Du Bois calls a double consciousness. It's this double consciousness is what Moses had because he's like, I can relate to anybody, but I don't feel like I fit in anywhere. Who, who is this part for? I just, let me hear this part. He says, I, I, he's, he's like, you put me in any room, I'm there. I know how to work whatever room you put me in. But I don't feel at home in, in, in any one room. <laughs> he said, watch this. So he, he wrestles with, I got an affinity for Egyptian culture, but in my heart I'm a Hebrew. So I... I feel this pull and this tension because I'm too Hebrew to be Egyptian. But I'm too Egyptian to be Hebrew. (laughs) And the Bible says that one day he walks out and he sees a Hebrew being beaten and bruised and destroyed and instinctively He comes to the defense of the Hebrew, takes the life of the Egyptian, buries the Egyptian in the sand, comes back out. Don't don't miss this. Are y'all ready for this? In the back, are y'all ready for this? All right, here it is. He comes back out later, and he sees two Hebrews going at it with each other. So he tries to help them because he just risks everything to help them. And he get rejected by people he trying to help that he don't even need. See, that was too real. Let me go this side. But I'm not backing up. They needed what Moses had way more than Moses needed what they had. And then as you evolve and advance, you got to be willing to be rejected by people. You able to help. (laughs) You will be treated by people who really need you like you need them. Are y'all all all right? I got a few more minutes. I know the food truck's outside, but just give me a few minutes. Let me, let me, let me feed you spiritually first. All right. So Moses now says, okay, I'm tired of this. I'm not helping anybody else. I risked everything to help y'all. Y'all funny. Y'all acting funny with me. All right, I'm gone. See, you just messed it up for everybody else. This is the last time I put my name out there for somebody. This is the last time I invest in somebody. This is the last time I I, I put my heart out there like that. So he calls himself running away. (laughs) 
not realizing and recognizing that God exists what Dr. Kenneth Alma calls an eternal isness. So he never was, was, he already is what he will be. So he exists in three dimensions simultaneously, past, present, and future. So when you run backwards, he there. When you stay still, he there too. And when you try to get ahead of him, you run into him getting ahead of him. Say, Moses, you can't run from this. I save your life, so I determine how you use it. You don't. So don't miss this. So he's minding his business. God starts setting stuff on bushes on fire, <laughs> telling him to take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And he says to Moses, now I want you to go back to the same place that you said you would never go back to. I want you to go to the same people that you said you were done with. <laughs> I want you to go back to the place that you don't need to go back to. Because I've given you an assignment to lead my people on an exodus out of Egypt. Don't miss this. God's talking to Moses trying to convince him to come. Israel has no idea that this conversation is taking place. So they're crying out to God saying, God, get us out. God, make a way. God, open a door. And God's saying nothing to them. But the whole time, he's engaged in a full-blown conversation with Moses. They have no idea that the reason God is not talking to them about the problem is because God is talking to Moses about the answer. Let me just release this prophetic word over somebody's life. God is not talking to you about it because he's talking to Moses about it. See, I'm talking to your answer. And Moses shows up in Egypt unannounced. No warning, no word no preview he just shows up and that's what some things are getting ready to do in your life Moses is just gonna sh the answer is just gonna show up no warning no word no sensing I got a few more minutes are y'all all right listen to this text says he asks God, he said, okay, now, God, you want me to do what? He said, okay, all right, I'm going. But these people are in a polytheistic culture. They got sun gods, moon gods, fertility gods, all kinds of gods. So when I go and say God, that's not enough. They're going to ask me which one. So when I go, who do I need to tell them sent me? He said, I am. <laughs> Moses said, what? I am. He said, what's the last name? That I am. He says, right now, that's all you need to know. If you know that, you don't need to know another name. If you know that, you don't need to know Greek, he, Hebrew. If you know that, you don't need to know Greek. If you know that, you don't need to know Egyptian. Because what he told him was, is what he told him Yahweh. We translate in English Jehovah, right? And Jehovah is his covenant name, right? And so it's almost used like a prefix in the Old Testament. So it's Jehovah, Jireh. Jehovah, Nisi. Jehovah, Shalom. So what he's saying is, Moses, I'm a covenant-keeping God. So right now, I'm going to give you the first part. And I'm going to let you use a blank for the last part. Because when you get in a certain situation, you're going to need me to be Jireh. So I'll fill in the blank with that. And when you get in another situation, you'll need me to be peace. And I'll fill in the blank with Shalom. And when you get to another place, you'll need me to give you victory in battle. And you'll fill in the blank with Jehovah Nisi. And so God makes it easy for us in the New Testament. Instead of using all those names, he say, I'm going to give you one name. 
that's above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every, every knee must bow, every tongue must confess. So when you say Jesus, you say saying Jaira. When you say Jesus, you say saying Tosikano. When you say saying Jesus, you say saying Shama. Somebody make the devil mad and just shout Jesus. Y'all not shouting in Atlanta tonight? I said shout Jesus. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Here it is. Wait a minute. So God tells Moses, we still in Exodus 3, in verse 11, he says, now listen. He says, I'm going to make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards you. Moses is like, well, Wait now. I'm an in the background guy. You got me out here speaking and all of this. I don't do all that now. <laughs> he telling God, that's not my anointing. God's like, I tell you what your anointing is. You don't tell me. He's like, I've been in the background my whole life. God like so. Who you are is not who you've been. When you tell me that's not you, you're telling me I'm finished? You're telling me I'm finished with you then? He says, I'm slow of speech. Moses thought his speech was, was an exemption from the assignment. He's like, you asking me to do something I don't feel good at. And God's like, no, I'm asking you to do something you need me for. I want a church that, that'll get excited off the works. No, no. He said, you more comfortable using your gift. You more comfortable leaning on your gift. He says, I'm getting ready to put you in a season where you're going to have to lean on God. He says, I'm going to make you favorably disposed. I'm going to make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward you. So in Exodus 3.21, he says, listen, I'll make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, I want you to receive this. I want you to receive this. He says, you will not leave empty handed. He said, all this suffering, all this service, he says, I'm going to make sure you don't leave empty handed. I want someone to listen to what I'm about to tell you. God is not just the God of reconciliation. He is also the God of restitution. I said restitution. Payback is coming. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. He promised me it was coming. He told me not to take vengeance into my own hands. He says, vengeance is mine, but he didn't stop there. He said, I will repay, says the Lord. Now watch how he repays. The way he repays is not by always punishing your enemies. The way he repays is by empowering you to succeed. In spite of them. Look, look, listen to me. Listen to me. David said he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. So restitution looks like this. God doesn't kill my enemies. He keeps them alive. And keeps them close enough to watch him prepare a table for me. They punishment is watching you win. I want somebody that receives that to give God praise all over this house. Watch me win. Watch me win. Watch me win. I got six minutes. Are you all right? 
Watch me win. That's their torture. Woo! Did you hear what I just said? I said, that's their torture. So text says, they go through all of the, the antics with Moses trying to convince Pharaoh. Egypt goes through plagues. Pharaoh finally decides to release Egypt out of Egyptian bondage and captivity. And the Bible says, I'm trying to behave. See, this is one of the reasons I take sabbaticals every year because I have to preach out of the overflow of my own relationship with God. So what I'm preaching to you is preaching to me. I'm feeding both of us at the same time. If I don't feel it, I can't preach it. And if it doesn't move me, I shouldn't preach it to you. Listen to this. The Bible says, now I'm in Exodus 13, it says that when Moses led Israel out of Egypt, it says God did not take them by way of the Philistines, even though that route was shorter, lest they see war and return back to Egypt. They were out of Egypt. Egypt was not not out of them. God knows what battles you're not ready for. Because premature battles will make you backslide. He said, they get this fight, they're going back to Egypt. It says, so he led them around toward the Red Sea. Wait a minute. If you went to Sunday school, wait a minute. The text says, Check me out. God led them around by the Red Sea. So they could have went another way that avoided the Red Sea. But God said, I'd rather you deal with the sea than the Philistine. See, sometimes we complain about the sea when we should be praising. Because God said, I let you avoid the Philistine. I want to tell you, watch, I want to tell you right now, the trial you in is a lot smaller than the trial he protected you from. Somebody better help me preach tonight. I said the trial you in is a lot smaller than the one he protected you from. The one you got may not even be the one the enemy wanted you to have. Y'all all right? I got three minutes. So God, you mean to tell me this whole Red Sea debacle is your fault? (laughs) We've been talking our entire religious life about how you delivered Israel out of the Red Sea. But the only reason they wrestling with the Red Sea is because you led them there. I'm not going to bother this because I, I, don't, I don't know how fragile your theology is. <laughs> and I don't want to deconstruct what I, what I don't have time to reconstruct. But what do, what do you do when the problem you walked into is a problem you walked into because you followed God into it? See, you can't bind it when God do it. Yeah, you can bind the devil. You can't bind God. (laughs) 
Here it is. God, it's your fault. It's your fault. And I love, see, I love Egypt. I love, I love the Hebrews because, you know, they were really infants in Christ. They didn't learn the ways of Yahweh. So they were a lot more authentic. They hadn't been discipled into pretension and fakeness. They weren't too religious, so they were actually real. So they said what most of us think and are scared to say. God, this is your fault. I wouldn't be in this if I didn't obey you. How is it that doing right feel wrong? How is it that my obedience made me vulnerable? I wouldn't even be in this position if I didn't obey. Israel get mad at Moses. Say, you brought us out here to die? Come on, bro. We could have stayed in the wilderness. I mean, you could have stayed in Egypt. He says, what are we going to do? They say, what are we going to do? Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Then Moses go to God and say, what are we going to do? <laughs> I'm not going to bother that, but every leader should have caught that revelation right there. Sometimes you got to display a confidence to the people. Sometimes you got to be sure when you're not sure. We're going to be all right now, God. Come on, I need every parent to say amen right there. Sometimes you got to look at the kids and be like, we're going to be all right. And go to God and say, now, God, listen. I need you to fix this. Listen to this, y'all. I'm wrapping up. He, he, he tells Moses, he says, I want you to come here, leaders. Raise your hand. Excuse me. Raise your staff. Stretch your hand. He says, you can't go any further until you raise the staff. And then stretch your hand. Come here, leaders. Do you raise your team? See, watch this. Because most leaders want a team, but they're not willing to raise one. (laughs) And the Bible says, are y'all ready for this? I'm done now. It says, when he does that, the wind begins to blow. We read it, foundational text, all that night, the wind began to blow. See, the Red Sea wasn't, didn't part immediately. It parted overnight. Come on. Come on. See, some of us are panicking because the way hadn't been made. We should be praising because the wind is blowing. I, I, need, I need somebody that caught that. I said, the door isn't open, but the wind is blowing. The way it made, but the wind is blowing. And I'm getting ready to praise God on the wind because if the wind is blowing, a way is being made. So it looks like Israel's about to be destroyed. It looks like Israel is trapped. It looks like Israel's in a place of vulnerability. It looks like Israel's about to drown in the Red Sea. But then God sends the wind and parts the Red Sea. They walk through on dry ground. Now they get to the other side and they think God parting the Red Sea was to get them over. That's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. When they get to the other side, they look again. And when they look again, they begin to see that the Red Sea that was parted now begins to collapse. And it drowns 
Pharaoh and his army in the sea. So the trial that they thought was going to kill them was actually a trial God was using to kill the thing that's been torturing them for 400 years. I came to tell somebody, you've been mislabeling this trial and the word I want to give you is look again. This isn't to kill you. This is to kill what's been killing you. This is getting ready to kill pride. This is getting ready to kill ego. This is getting ready to kill impulsiveness. Go ahead and do what you gotta do, God. Get me to the other side. Don't touch anybody. Don't touch anybody. But just air high five somebody and tell them, look again. I don't care what it looks like. Look again. I don't care what it feels like. Look again. I don't care what they calling it. Look, look again. And God will turn your morning into dancing. God will give you the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaven is God will turn your situation. I'm done. Look. This, this is what I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me. I'm done, tell you. He said, Darius, you will live like what you label it. So if you label it rejection, you will live like it. But if you label it direction, you will live like it. I don't know what you've been calling it, but it's not what it looks like. I know what you saw the first time you looked at it. you'll see that what you thought was going to drown you is actually what God's using to drown Pharaoh. Ooh, I can't testify, but I wish I could testify. Some of the spaces and places that were so confusing and so frustrating and God, why is this like this? And why is this not working the way it's supposed to be working? Oh, when I look again. It's that you anchored me in something that was, wasn't working to hold, me long, to hold me still long enough until you brought me the thing that was working. I want you to, I don't know what you called it and what you're calling. It's not what it looks like. Thank you, Jesus. We're getting ready to go. I'm going to pray us out of here. But I've seen him move move mountains and I believe I'll see him do it again did you hear me up there I said I've seen him move anybody besides me
Come on, sing it, family. I see you moving, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see tonight come on ATL I said can you help me thank God for visiting us tonight we're, we're really excited and believing God for the best I want to pray over you I, I want to pray over you I want to pray over you I think at least it's my goal as a leader to be a chief praying officer our church was about five years old one time chick and I was in New Jersey shaking hands after and a lady came up to me and she was like, oh, pastor, thank you so much for praying for me. I felt your prayers. I got a good report. And I, I sat there saying to myself, I wasn't praying. I said, I didn't pray. I made a decision at year five. Yes, yes. I said, I'm going to pray for my people like they think I do. Come on. Oh, my God. Y'all missed what I just said. I said, I'm going to pray for them the way they think I do. I literally have a list. Like when people give, I have a list. Yeah. It's still paper. You know, Teddy. Yeah. It's still paper. And every time God answers one, I scratch it off. Hey. And I leave it there so that when I go to pray, before I ask him for something new, I see the evidence of everything that he's did. That's all. I can, I can look at that list and say, I seen you move. Yeah. You move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. So I pray for you in private. I've, I've been praying for this event most of the day, but I want to pray of you as you leave. I want to pray that God, that when you walk out of this building, that you're walking out of an old season into a new one. I pray that as you walk out of this building, you walk out of old vision in the new vision. That you see differently. I pray that as you walk out of this building, you walk out of old mindsets to new mindsets because you go to the new level, every new level here first. Once you get your mind out, your life follows. Father, I pray now a prayer of divine transition over your people in the words of dr peter wagner father we do smart bomb tactical praying i pray for divine transition metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly i pray that the god who opens blind eyes will give your people new vision that they will see again I pray that the God who renews our mind would shift the minds of your people. May they think higher, better, transcendent thinking. We pray for that. And I pray that, that your people will shed old wineskins to embrace new ones, to receive all that you're getting ready to pour. May this night be marked on your eternal calendar as a night that some things shifted for your people. Knowing you like we know you, you've already heard this prayer because you told us to call upon you and you'll answer us and show us great and mighty things that we know not of. We call you now and we believe this to be done 
We ask it in Jesus' name. It's in that name that we pray. Somebody shout amen. God bless you.